connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Doug Maynard, your host for the next hour or so. Uh, and Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to curate and convene and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community uh, with our goal to spark conversation, ideas, and action. And since we are live, I do want to remind everyone that you do have the opportunity to type in questions throughout this session. Uh, so do type those questions in at any time you think of them. Don't feel you need to wait until the end of the of the uh, of the session. Uh, uh, type them in as you think of them, so we have them ready to uh, present to our our, pre our presenters uh, at any point throughout the uh, throughout the session. And we do have uh, four presenters today. So if you can help us out by uh, telling us who you're directing the question to, if it's a specific question to one of the presenters or related to something they were specifically talking about, uh, please do that. That'll help us uh, identify who the question uh, uh, should be directed to. And also, uh, don't hesitate to share your thoughts on Twitter. And if you do, be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. All right, so today we're going to be talking about redefining outcomes of very preterm birth and, and including the parent's voice in research. And we're going to introduce everyone to the Parent's Voice Project and why it's important for parents to be partners in research. And uh, this uh, webinar is actually uh, one of the uh, webinars that we're doing in partnership with Childbright, uh, the Childbright Spore, part of the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research funded by uh, the Canadian Institutes for Health, uh, Health Research. Uh, we've been doing a number of webinars uh, with, uh, with Childbright over the last uh, year or, or so actually and all of the previous child bright webinars are, are available on the on the knowledge exchange network uh, if you're uh, interested in learning more about child bright as well um, you can go to their website at childbright.ca all right so with uh, with that out of the way, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel. As I mentioned, we have four presenters. Uh, we're going to hear from Rebecca Pierce, who is the mother of a nine of nine year old Marin, who was born at 25 weeks uh, gestational age, and six year old Eleanor, who was born at term. Uh, Rebecca has been a partner uh, or a parent representative with the Parten Parteneriat Famille team at uh, St. Justin Hospital in Montreal for several years, involved in outreach and patient centered research. And for the past, but in her day job, I guess you'd call it. Uh, her For 13 years, she's been a secondary, uh, uh, a secondary science teacher uh, in Montreal. Uh, and she's also actually a second year PhD student in uh, science and math at McGill. Uh, and joining um, Rebecca, also in Montreal, is Dr. Annie Janvier, uh, who is a neonatologist and clinical ethicist at, in Montreal. Uh, she co-directs the master's and PhD programs in clinical ethics at the University of Montreal. And we are also joining them in Montreal is Dr. T. Mai Lu, who is a clinical scientist, epidemiologist, and pediatrician at the Neonatal Follow-Up Clinic at CHU St. Justin in Montreal. And she's been involved with the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network since 2009 in both the database and, and the steering committee. And finally, uh, who will be kicking it off, we have Dr. Ann Sines going all the way to the West Coast in BC. Uh, Dr. Ann Sines, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Ann Sinis is a neonatologist at uh, BC Women. Uh, Women's Hospital in Vancouver, and she's the medical director of the Neonatal Follow-Up Clinic and founding director of the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network. Uh, so without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Ann Sinis. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this um, webinar and letting giving us the opportunity to talk about um, what we think is a very important topic. Uh, next slide. Next slide. 
So um, children born preterm are fairly common and make up about 10% of, um, of all births. Uh, and about 1% of those are born extremely preterm, less than 28 weeks gestation, and remembering that a normal pregnancy goes to 40 weeks. Next slide. And about 40 years ago, um, extremely preterm babies uh, rarely survived, and so we didn't know uh, what the future held for these children. Um, the good news now is that survival um, has improved dramatically so that 23 to 24 weeks, almost two-thirds survive. And at 25 to 26 weeks, it's almost 90%. And then when you get to 27 to 28 weeks, 95% now survive based on data we have from the Canadian Neonatal Network, most recent report of 2017. Next slide. Um, but what happens after a baby is discharged from the um, neonatal intensive care unit is important. And for these um, very extremely preterm babies, um, there's a lot of development that happens in their bodies in this critical period, which is then happening outside the uterus instead of inside the uterus. And this includes everything from hearts and lungs, which are important for survival, but also things such as kidneys and bones um, and um, of great importance also the brain. Next slide. Um, so with this question of uh, what is life um, like for children um, born this um, tiny, um, neonatal follow-up programs have been um, seeing these children and describing their outcomes. And we do know that neurodevelopmental challenges are quite um, common. Next slide. Um, and so neonatal follow-up programs have been important to be able to describe what the future looks like for these children as well as um, for each individual child to help them reach their potential um, to grow and develop to their best. Next slide. Um, the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network um, is a voluntary collaboration between all the follow-up programs in, in Canada. Um, and w we developed it in liaison with the Canadian Neonatal Network so that we could describe um, and be able to help not, um, not just knowing about what happens when these babies are in the nursery, but what happens um, after they leave the nursery. Um, so the network um, integrates uh, data collection between the, the neonatal network um, and the follow-up, um, and we collaborate in, in research um, with the goal to be able to um, improve um, outcomes for these, um, for these special children. Next slide. Uh, so what we have been um, doing uh, since um, babies born in 2009 is that across all of Canada, um, children born at less than or equal to 28 weeks gestation all have a similar visit um, when they are 18 to 21 months corrected age. That means um, age based on their due date rather than their actual birth date. Um, and we look at a variety of um, health outcomes, which includes uh, what's their hearing like, their vision, um, do they have cerebral palsy, and if so, you know, how severe is it, how is it affecting their function, um, and we use a um, standardized way of assessing their de development um, called the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development, the third um, edition, where we can look at um, their language, their um, cognitive or thinking abilities, and their motor um, abilities um, across Canada. Um, next slide. So the challenges um, when we have this information, how do we use that information to describe um, what the lives of these children look like? Uh, 
and going to the literature and looking at the leading um, experts around the um, world, um, we developed the definitions that you see um, on this um, on this slide um, and categorized it um, first on the right hand side, what we called neurodevelopmental um, impairment, um, which is fairly um, we thought was fairly severe. No, sorry, uh, which captured a variety of um, abnormal abnormalities that these children might um, face. Um, with the premise that we were thinking these are things that um, we could, uh, we would want to try to improve over um, over time. Um, and then in the literature, people talked about a severe neurodevelopmental impairment, which was um, with worse out outcomes. Um, and the first thing we learned talking to parents was they didn't think um, the term severe was good. So um, we have subsequently changed that um, to call it significant. Um, and again, we looked at um, less common um, impairments, which are going, can be anticipated to affect these children's lives in one way or another. Um, but it became clear to us um, in discussion and presenting our results um, that maybe we th these definitions aren't actually what parents um, want. Maybe it's not um, the right definition. Um, so next. Um, so what we did learn using those definitions um, is that NDI, so neurodevelopmental impairment, um, is common. It's 46%, um, uh, and so it affects a lot of a lot of children. Um, and as you can see between the red and the blue bars, um, from um, two different time periods, it's not really changing um, changing over time. Um, as expected, the significant neurodevelopmental um, impairment is less common, but is still affecting about 16% of our um, of our kids. Um, and so we won't talk about it today. But one of our Child Bright projects is what can we do to improve these um, improve these outcomes, particularly language, which is common, and cognitive um, um, outcomes. Um, next slide. So what we're going to talk about today um, are some of the other projects that we are fortunate um, to be partnering with Child Bright um, under what we call our Parent Epic Project. Um, and um, we will start with um, Rebecca's um, story, and then we will talk about um, why do we need to measure outcomes in the first place, um, the work that we have done so far on our Parents' Voice project as part of Parent Epic, um, and end with um, our thoughts about why we need to do research with families and not about families. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Rebecca. Next slide. Thanks so much, Anne. So one of the big questions that underlies this project is why neurodevelopmental impairment has been chosen as a measure of NICU success. So why has it become central to the way that patients are counseled and prognoses are discussed with them? And do the answers to that question actually address the real concerns and needs of parents of children that are born preterm? So my first real introduction, my crash course to the concept of prematurity, occurred on Friday, September 18th, 2009, when I started to bleed heavily 25 weeks into my pregnancy with twin girls. So my husband and I went off to the hospital where I was supposed to deliver, not really understanding what was actually going on. When I told the triage nurse I was 25 weeks pregnant, she said they would admit me because I was more than 24 weeks pregnant. And up until then, the idea of having a baby so early had never even crossed my mind. I had very little concept of what 24 or 25 weeks gestational age actually meant or what it looked like. 
I was transferred to St. Justine Hospital in Montreal as they had the closest NICU. And on Monday, September 21st, 2009, I delivered Marin Irene at 760 grams and Lily Ruth at 840 grams at 25 weeks and five days gestational age. My husband, Jason, and I settled in for a long stay in the hospital with our twins. The following weekend was when our world came crashing down. My parents came from Ontario to visit for the weekend. They had been unable to come before then because my mother was dying of pancreatic cancer at the time. And she would die almost two months to the day after Marin and Lily were born. And I'm not talking about this here for sympathy, uh, but just to remind medical professionals out there that many families with children in the NICU have other pressures or traumas or stresses that they are dealing with on top of their having a sick baby. The Sunday following her birth, Lily developed a sudden infection that led to intestinal damage and a brain hemorrhage, and she died. This began two months of terror as Marin's course in the NICU turned rocky. It turned out that Lily had a bacterial infection, and so Marin was started on a life-saving course of antibiotics as she had the same infection. Several weeks after birth, she required a PDA ligation that was risky because of her instability, but she survived the surgery. She caught a rare fungal infection that needed treatment. She developed bronchopulmonary dysplasia and spent lots of time on 100% oxygen or on a high frequency ventilator. So we were also worried about her developing retinopathy of prematurity. She was on a ventilator for a total of seven weeks and required steroids to wean her from it. Finally, about two months into her NICU stay, things started to stabilize. And after about three months in the NICU, she was finally moved to the intermediate facility where we could prepare to take her home. A few weeks before we thought Marin might finally be discharged, we were approached by a doctor about performing a head MRI on Marin. I don't specifically remember being told much about why this was, other than it was standard at St. Justine at the time for babies born below 26 weeks to have this MRI. And I don't remember discussing much about what information the MRI could or couldn't tell us. We thought, sure, sure, why not? Jason's a scientist, I'm a science teacher, and at the time we firmly believed that we could advance scientific knowledge, then we would. Besides, Marin was doing well, she seemed to be developing normally, and none of her head ultrasounds had indicated any problems, so what could the harm be? However, when the MRI results came back, one of the neonatologists broke the news to us that the scan had discovered moderate damage to Marin's cerebellum caused by a previously undetected brain bleed. Once again, we were totally floored and devastated. This news was completely unexpected, and the worst thing was that nobody could tell us what it meant. We wanted to know whether Marin would be able to walk. Would she be able to talk? Could she go to a regular school? Could she live on her own? The doctor was cautiously optimistic, but of course nobody knew for sure, and now we had this sword hanging over our heads. So with this knowledge, Marin was discharged from the hospital at the end of January 2010, four months and one week after her birth. As she got older, I tried to find information, research to read some sort of crystal ball that would tell me how my child was going to turn out. With a full-term baby, first-time parents are usually stressed out about their child's development and milestones, but with Marin's prematurity and her MRI results, we were pretty frantic and terrified. And this is when I began to understand how limited the research, for parents anyway, is into the outcomes of preterm children. So as previously mentioned, there's a real focus in the follow-up literature with neurocognitive outcomes. For example, blindness, deafness, cerebral palsy, an IQ of less than 85, but also things like learning disabilities and vision problems. The trouble with these measures is they are reported as dichotomous, so either the child has it or doesn't, without acknowledging that most of the out these outcomes are continuous and fall within a quite wide range. For example, children can have a range of vision problems, they can wear glasses or they can be totally blind, they can have mild, moderate or severe cerebral palsy, and they can have a huge range of learning differences or disabilities. Marin had visits to the neonatology follow-up clinic at St. Justine, where she was given tests such as the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development. But the problem with these tests is that parents may think that a low score means their child is impaired when this is not necessarily the case. While these tests can identify children that may need more follow-up, they have limited predictive value, so they may not be relevant for parents and, in fact, harmful. Most of the outcome measures that have been chosen for research have been done so by neonatologists, developmental psychologists, or clinicians without considering what parents or families may consider important or impactful. For example, Marin had to be rehospitalized with pneumonia numerous times before her third birthday, which was enormously difficult for her and for us. There is little research that considers rehospitalization as an impactful outcome. I was recently communicating with a colleague of my sister, who is the mother of a preemie, who is having significant difficulties with eating, and this has had a huge impact on the quality of her life and the life of her family. But again, this is not examined in follow-up studies. 
I wanted to know how families cope with the stresses and uncertainty of having a preterm child, but information about this was hard to find as well. What was easy to find was very medicalized, deficit-based research that focuses on all the problems that preterm children as a group have without any discussion of their positive attributes and what they can do and be. The voices of parents, families, and preterm children is also largely absent in outcome research. For example, there's a small amount of research that examines the quality of life and functioning of preterm children as they get older, and this research has actually shown that individuals born preterm generally rate their happiness and quality of life is equal to that of their term-born peers. So today, Marin is a happy, healthy nine-year-old child. We've certainly not had a completely smooth road over the last nine years, but she's more amazing than I could have ever imagined she would be, a kind sister, a loyal friend, and a bright, funny daughter. So in summary, with this project, we hope to problematize the fact that many outcome measures reflect the values of researchers, not necessarily those of parents or families. We know that extreme prematurity is devastating and we wouldn't wish it for any child. However, does this prematurity impact most families on a daily basis? Probably not. Do most preterm children do okay in school? Are they happy? Yes, they are. Do most of them have serious long-term health problems? No. Most preterm children are independent and functional in society. They're strong and resilient. They have friends. They are funny and kind. And perhaps most importantly, do the parents of preterm children love and value them? The answer is definitively yes. So in closing, the reason why I became involved in this project is to try to help frame outcomes using a parental perspective to provide what I hope is relevant, meaningful information for future parents such as myself. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today, and it's it's a hard uh, story to follow up with because it's going to be more boring scientific things I'm going to talk about. Um, and the, the core question here is, why do we measure neonatal outcomes? Um, we measure them for clinical reasons because it's a good developmental screening assessment for particular kids and to individualize care. But we also measure it as a group, for example, for quality improvement. So from one year to the next, is our neonatal intensive care unit uh, worse with infections, better, or more, do more kids have uh, impairments, and what can we do about this? So we need to follow this up, and between units and within units. We also need outcomes to measure when we do trials or randomized trials, clinical trials, to have something to measure. So what is the rate of cerebral palsy, for example? So we need some hard outcomes to measure. And we also need them to inform and help parents. And all these four <clears throat> different reasons for measuring will have impacts on families, on researchers, but they're not aimed uh, at the same thing. And just to tie into what Rebecca spoke about, there's problems with measuring outcomes. Um, the clinicians and the researchers, first of all, decide the categories of severe, moderate, minor. For example, in neurodevelopmental impairment, we have decided that severe is cerebral pal palsy, deafness, blindness, and a developmental delay <clears throat> less than a certain percentile that we decide. Um, we have definitions for moderate, for mild, and for quote-unquote normal or non-disabled. But when we ask parents, sometimes kids that we label as mild for parents, for example, severe behavioral disorders, are severe. And also, conversely, many problems we identify as severe can be seen as mild for families. So parents may categorize their children differently. There's also a problem of conflating outcomes. So when we measure outcomes, when they are competing, so you cannot have, uh, if you are dead, you cannot have a neurodevelopmental impairment. So we measure death or neurodevelopmental impairment or death or lung disease. Um, and the problem with conflating outcomes is that these outcomes are not similar to families. So there's guidelines for conflating outcomes that seem to have been ignored by neonatologists. So for all these conflated outcomes you see above, death and impairment, death and lung disease, death and retinopathy, eye problems, um, they're not of similar importance for families. They don't have a similar relative risk and their frequency is not in the same range, yet we conflate them. 
And when we look at all the other literature, for example, the cancer literature, we do not find death or colostomy or death or erectile dysfunction when we look at outcomes for certain cancers. So we have to keep this in mind too. The other significant issues is that the outcomes that we measure influence the life and death decisions that we take. We have guidelines for whom we start resuscitation on, which tiny fragile baby will be given intensive care or palliative care. We have guidelines for when we speak to parents about stopping the respirator in the best interest of the baby because they're, he would be or she too disabled in the long run. And these are made based on that research. So judgments about what is futile, should we continue the respirator or not, or beneficial, are made using these 12 to 24 months outcome. And there's no input from families who are given these outcomes during prenatal consultation to make life and death decisions or when deciding to stop the respirator and taking life and death decisions later. So how can we integrate the parental perspectives and rigorously investigate what matters to family? So parent or patient or family important outcomes. And the aim is to improve what is most important to patients and families, not necessarily what is most important to researchers or clinicians. That can be tricky to measure family or patient important outcomes. It's complex because it needs to be representative. So we need to give all parents a voice. The best way to do this in when we have large cohorts, such as the CN fund cohorts or the neonatal cohorts, follow-up cohorts we have, is to use mixed methods to keep an open mind. So avoid first using quantitative questionnaires that are developed essentially by researchers and clinicians and sometimes a little group of parents. So to keep an open mind is to do mixed methods and integrate qualitative and quantitative um, methods. So we kind of mix, there seems to be in the research world, qualitative religion and the quantitative religion of how to do research. But when you do mixed methods, you, kind of, you place a p-value on stories and you're able to ask all the parents their stories. Um, what I would recommend is to avoid very small groups such as qualitative methods with an N of 12 because they may not be representative of what parents think. To avoid focus groups uh, and Delphi consensus which could be biased in these terms um, in, in these populations because those who go to focus groups are more likely to be women who like to look in group who are of higher socioeconomic status and we uh, then again there's a lot of parents who don't have a voice and you will see the methods the mixed methods we use um, are methods that we actually developed to have uh, everybody's voice. Flexibility of the methodology also of how we ask parents to voice what is important to them is critical. Some parents don't want to be videotaped or don't want to be um, interviewed. So we offer in this research a flexibility in terms of how parents can participate. Some parents still like the pen and paper questionnaire Many young parents now are in the internet area. They like to answer on their phone or an iPad. Others would like to speak to interviewer. Sometimes they would like to speak on the phone versus in person. So there's actually five to six different ways parents can uh, answer a questionnaire or can voice what is most important to them. So in summary, measuring outcomes of preterm infants is important. Um, this is how we will improve perinatal care, and this information is important for parents. And for clinicians and researchers, a good outcome is a disease-free survival, but for parents, we never ask them. We also found in the literature, um, I'm also the mother of a 24-week, a baby who was born at 24 weeks, um, and I'm also shocked the way Rebecca is as all the things we're measuring are deficits. So how everything that goes bad with preterm babies, but we never 
measure in a balanced fashion of what parents find positive uh, in their kids. And this, in this article, Stronger and More Vulnerable, you'll see all the authors are neonatologists or clinicians in neonatology who had a very sick baby. And we've learned positive things from our kids too. We've learned gratitude. Um, we've learned perspective of what is important in life, uh, that relationships are important. Um, forgiveness is important. Our definitions of perfection uh, is no longer a high percentage or performance. We can find perfection in places where clinicians can't. Um, so this strength and vulnerability, this resilience that we have developed as parents of preterm infants is something that make us better and that make our families also stronger, even if they're more fragile. So this also has to be uh, investigated and it hasn't been uh, up to now. So to get some insights into parental perspectives regarding outcomes of very preterm infants, we actually conducted a retrospective study on 190 parents of very preterm infants born before 29 weeks of gestational age. So at the 18 to 22 month neonatal follow-up visit, Parents um, in our clinic are filling the child behavior checklist. At the end of the child behavior checklist, there are actually two questions. What concerns you most about your child? And please describe the best things about your child. So we took those answers and performed a thematic analysis of what parents reported. So those are some of the examples that parents uh, could be writing. She's doing much better than I thought she would. So if we perform a thematic analysis, we could say that this is about good development. Another parent could say people love him. He lights up the room. So the theme that could emerge from that is a good personality and so on. So what were the main results? 73% of parents had both positive comments and concerns. 27% of parents had only positive comments. And interestingly, there were minimal associations between the answers that the parents gave and the presence or level of disability as we doctors defined it. So what were the positive themes that emerged, which are actually not always measured in neonatal follow-up studies? So 61% of parents reported about the good personality of their child, which could include easygoing, social, curious. For example, one person said, I have an adorable little boy who's happy, determined, working hard, social, and outgoing. 40% of parents mentioned happiness. 11% talked about health. For example, she has a perfect health. And 40% talked about developmental outcome. For example, one parent said, I'm very proud of his development. He's pretty good, better than what I had expected. But there were also concerns that, once again, are not always measured. As expected, developmental concerns were reported by 56% of parents, including language, psychological and behavioral problems, motor and global development. For example, his behavior worries me, he gets mad, he's aggressive. But also 24% reported about physical health concerns, growth and nutrition, respiratory, common pediatric issues. For example, he only eats purees, he does not eat on his own, or he's difficult to fall asleep, or her lung weakness, she's so fragile with infections. There were also 5% of parents who reported concerns about the future, but interestingly, 16% explicitly told us that they had no concerns. And I love this quote, actually, I'm worried about your opinion, not my daughter. So regardless of the level of neurodevelopmental impairment, um, parents responded about the same. So you can see that there were three categories, no neurodevelopmental impairment, mild to moderate and severe, and this is how CN Fund classify it. And if we look at the parental response, the proportion of parents responding is about the same throughout the different categories, except for developmental concerns, which seem to be more prevalent um, for parents whose child had mild to moderate um, neurodevelopmental impairment. So neurodevelopment is not the only important outcome. Happiness, good personality, making progress is also important. And parents also have concerns other than neurodevelopment, like respiratory health, feeding, sleep, and behavior. However, our, our study had some limitations. 
The, resp the response rate was 70%, which could induce some selection bias. And the questions were part of the child behavior checklist, which could have oriented the answers toward more development and behavior. And this is only from one center, so is it generalizable? This is not known. So this is why we're doing the Parents' Voice Project, which is part of the Parent Epic Program, uh, which is funded by the Child Bright Network. And I have the chance to work with an amazing group of ladies, including um, parent representative like Kate Robson and Rebecca Pierce, developmental pediatrician like Magdalena Jaworski or Paige Church, neonatologists like Annie and Anne, and we also work with Claude Julie Book, who's a sociologist. And the goal of the Parents' Voice Project is to engage parents to co-create definitions of neurodevelopmental impairment. Not to end. So I'm so I'm going to then um, talk a little bit about what we've been doing um, with the Parents Voice Project, and one of the challenges in terms of getting parent opinions is, uh, as Annie alluded to, is you want to get a large spectrum um, of parents, um, but not all parents are going to be able to have the time to. Um, spend a lot of time in a focus group or another research project. So we therefore decided that we wanted to capture both the breadth and the depth of parents' voices. Um, the first um, question to capture the breadth of voices um, is a simple question that we are asking parent, all parents who come to an email follow-up program in, across Canada. So we hope to be able to get um, about a thousand parents and we want um, to build on what the Montreal group has done and just ask the um, parents and caregivers how they perceive their child's development, whether they think they're child has no concerns and is developing normally, um, or whether they see their child's de neural development as um, having a mild, moderate, or severe concern. Um, and so this is currently in, um, in progress, and um, we haven't uh, analyzed the, the results, but hope to have some in a year or so. Next slide. Um, so, uh, my talked about, um, the study that they did and that there was the need to validate those, um, findings, um, in a different study and in a questionnaire that is, um, prospective and separate from being attached to the child behavior checklist questionnaire. Um, so we developed um, a, a survey um, which we are asking parents um, in Vancouver and, and Montreal and Toronto will um, be joining us um, later. Um, and though we won't be able to get thousands of voices, we do um, expect to get the voice of um, of at least 150 um, parents to see if we can validate um, the the study we just talked about. Next slide. Um, now, in that survey, we are asking um, parents about their own child. The next question we had is, well, if um, parents were then asked about a clinical vignette, a story about another child that's not theirs, um, would we get um, different types of um, answers? Um, and at the same time, knowing that um, in research, such as what we do in the Canadian Nino you know, Follow-Up Network, um, that we want to be able to decide how do we um, adapt or change the definitions we're using. We needed to be able to, to tease apart the different um, components that we're using in neurodevelopmental impairment and the number of impairments um, a child has. 
Um, so together with the summer student last year, we developed um, 11 um, vignettes based on the information we're currently collecting in the Canadian Email Follow-Up Network. Um, and after pilot testing it, um, we are now um, in Vancouver asking um, parents how they um, rate um, the different vignettes so that we can be able to compare um, the different um, components and aspects of that to help us be able to redefine um, how we measure um, outcomes. Next slide. Um, so this is just an example of what the vignette would look like. Um, and it is an example of a child who has cerebral, um, cerebral palsy um, and um, who typically, of course, at 18 months, most children can walk. And in this case, um, this child described can um, uh, roll and, and creep, um, but it, you know, it's anticipated that he will need a wheelchair um, in, the f in the future. Um, other aspects of his um, development um, are, are typical. Um, and as you can see for each of the vignettes, we are asking um, parent respondents to rate um, uh, from zero to 10 in terms of whether this child represents the um, where on the scale of worst possible health to best possible health does this child um, fall and would they consider it a severe um, health condition um, and do they think that this is information that um, parents who have a preemie would um, would want to know about um, so we have um, recently started uh, asking parents here in Vancouver um, this um, this survey. Next slide. So the last part of the Parents Voice project is a survey with open-ended questions that we are doing in Montreal. So for over the past year, all families who've been seen for follow-up for their 18-month, three-year, five-year, or seven-year visit have been recruited into the study. And we actually had a very high participation rate with uh, so far 210 parents um, answering the, uh, the survey and our target number is 250. So I'm glad to be showing today some preliminary results. So the first question, which is actually not open-ended, but is please rate your child's health from your point of view on this scale from zero to 10. And the median score is actually nine, which is, as you can see, very high. We also ask if you could improve up to two things about your child's health and or development, what would they be? So parents gave an answer, and from that, once again, we developed teams, and you would expect that the emerging, the top emerging teams would be neurodevelopment, given that this is the focus of neonatal follow-up. But here's our top five. Actually, top number one is respiratory health. Two, it's nothing. Three, behavior mental health. Four, feeding and growth. And five, cognition and learning problems. We're also asking them, please tell us one or two positive impacts of your child's birth that you consider the most important on your life or family life. So the top two emerging themes are the parents' outlook on life. So they will talk about their different perspective on life, which means going back to the basics, maybe enjoying life and help more than another family. They also talk a lot about that all of this is a miracle. And another impact, which is often mentioned, is the child's health and development. We're also asking, please tell us one or two negative impacts of your child's birth that you consider the most important on your life or family life. The top three answers so far are parental stress and fear. They also report about their loss of equilibrium, given the, the many uh, appointments, the many, the, uh, the lot, the um, the excessive amount of time spent in the hospital. And some parents will also report as a negative impact the child's health and development. 
Finally, one of the question is knowing what you know now, what do you wish doctors would have told you about prematurity before and or after your child's birth? The first, the top emerging theme is nothing more, which is actually good news for clinicians. The second message is be more optimistic. And we've been talking a lot about this throughout this presentation. Give a positive framing to your message. Give us some hope. And the third theme so far emerging is outcomes of preterm babies after NICU discharge, but not just development, health also, and the child's functioning. So once we have a final result on the four sub-project of the Parents' Voice project, what we're planning to do is uh, to uh, convey a CN fund working group with neonatal follow-up doctors, allied healthcare professional, and parents to whom we'll show the results. And from those results, we're hoping to create a list of meaningful outcomes that can be feasibly collected throughout Canada as part of CN Fund. We also want to create meaningful definitions of neurodevelopmental outcomes and potentially um, organize an international workshop where we could be standardizing, standardizing definition across the world, definitions of outcomes which are actually meaningful to parents. And the message we've learned, um, uh, our group, is that working with families from the start is important to be humble and curious, uh, humble that what we think is important may not be important for families and curious about what is, and to do research with families and not about families. So maybe clinicians are the experts of our kids' health care, but families are also the experts of their children. So what is important, we have been conducting these studies for the past decades with families and to incorporate them in the study design. Why we're looking for something to co construct the questionnaire, are they too long? Um, is uh, are all, the con all the consultation that we have, how can we write this to be sensitive? How can we ask them for their opinion? The informed consent process, it's often too long for parents, but too short for the IRB. So how to reach these compromises? Involving a parent in the analysis of results. If you look at how we report results in the neonatal literature, it's extremely pessimistic. Kids die, kids are disabled, kids are impaired. And interestingly, in the cancer literature, they, they say they have an amazing 10% survival, but we always speak about our 10% mortality. Um, so how to frame results is important. Involving families also enriches the manuscripts and publication. Does this make sense to them? Uh, or do we report things as the glass half empty as opposed to the glass half full? Informing families and all participants about results to, to send them the abstracts and the papers that we do, that is also important. Um, this should apply to all research subjects, but throughout the years we realized that a lot of parents to whom we send our articles bring them to their pediatricians. And this is a very good way to disseminate results. And involving parents in presentations and conferences, this is for another project, um, but today um, is an example of this where we can all have a voice together. So the take home messages uh, is that measuring and predicting outcomes is essential. Categorizing children is inevitable. We need hard categories, but these categories can also be defined by parents. Parents need to be informed about outcome research and understand why we measure their kids. There's many reasons for that. They should be partners in this research and help optimize research questions and priorities. So thank you very much. We'll take uh, time for questions now. All right, thank you very much for a great presentation. I mean, it's really quite inspiring to see the input uh, from the parents and, and they're, they're very much a, a different perspective that they take on these kinds of issues than clinicians do. So it's really, uh, it's a refresh, it's refreshing work uh, that you presented here. So a really great presentation from all of you. Um, we did have a comment uh, uh, come in and a question. Um, it says, uh, the first one that came in says, as Rebecca stated, it is important to remember that there is outside trauma and stressors that affect NICU parents. Uh, we also know that the NICU experience is very traumatic for families. Are there plans to include a component that looks at post-traumatic stress from the NICU stay as parent health and well-being ultimately affect outcomes? 
So this, this is, is and Cin uh, do you want to take it? Take it. <laughs> Go ahead, Anne. Why don't you uh, okay. Why don't you start? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I think that's a great question of the, the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I would say that individually we have um, recognized that um, parents and families um, do undergo post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the reason it's a good question is it's only recognized recently sort of been described um, and at this point um, we haven't looked in the best way to capture it and um, necessarily the best way to support these um, these parents so we are always looking for new ideas of important things and how we can support um, parents because another goal that we didn't list in the Canadian Neonatal follow-up network is advocacy and helping children and um, and families. So we'll put that on our future plans. I think if we, it's Annie here in, in Montreal, in our preliminary results, um, uh, stress, anxiety, fear for the future is certainly very real um, in the neonatal intensive care. And perhaps we can work there, but we've incorporated parents, veteran resource parents to come back to the unit and speak to new parents. And this, this has certainly helped with anxiety and fear. And I think I'd like to point out too that going back to follow up with your kid is extremely traumatizing, even as a neonatologist who's actually done some follow up. Um, we know our kid will be evaluated. We're very anxious about it. And going back to follow up was for me as a neonatologist, a trauma. And I know a lot of parents for whom this brings back nasty things in their heads about going back to the hospital, having your kid judged, feeling judged as a parent. And this has not been investigated, but I think it really needs uh, to be. All right. Uh, we did have a comment come in from Sherry who says she thanks you for the great presentation. She's a postpartum doula that focuses a lot on the experiences and expectations of parents and programs like this have that have parental involvement, uh, she says, is is indeed very refreshing so and very needed. So um, so she thanks uh, you for that. Just talking about uh, sort of the post-traumatic stress that, that parents uh, experience. I know the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario has produced uh, some work in that area around trauma experienced by parents of children with complex medical needs in particular. Uh, and you can find some of their information on their website. They just la just launched a, a video uh, where they interview a number of parents that, that want to share their, that shared their experiences around uh, trauma that they experience, emotional uh, trauma around uh, having a child with complex medical needs, not necessarily just a preterm uh, baby. But um, yeah. the next couple of questions come in from uh, James. He's got two questions, so we'll just take them one at a time. Um, and we'll start with the, the group in Montreal for this one. Uh, he's asking, are former neonatal patients being involved in this work? Parents are crucial, but their views are not always the same as adults who were born preterm. So this is uh, Tvimaya speaking. This is very interesting because we also have um, another completely different study with young adults born preterm. And what they've been telling us is, um, well, the prematurity story, this is my parents' story. It's not mine. I see myself as completely normal. Uh, so this is one message that they say, and and they're doing actually pretty great, but they don't see how different they are from their peers. The second message that they've been telling us is, I understand the stress my parents went through, but I also remember the overprotection. Unlike other kids, it's not fair that I didn't get to do sports like my child, my like my brothers and sister. That I didn't get to to go outside as often because my mom or my dad was afraid I would um, catch a cold. So this is very interesting to see the point of view of the uh, young adults, which are much more optimistic the majority of the time than their parents. And I, I think this is also seen a little bit in the in the quality of life literature when you ask the parents. Um, their perspective of their the quality of life of their child is less optimistic than the child themselves when they report it. This is Anne in Vancouver. 
Um, our colleague in Hamilton, who's done lots of the quality of life work, um, Saroj Segal, has also published a book called Preemie Voices. And it is the um, short stories about adults um, who were born premature and their perspective on their lives. Um, and I use that book for a lot of our um, trainees um, because it does give a really excellent insight to what um, our children born preterm um, view their lives when they become adults. All right. Um, the next uh, couple of uh, the next part of that question, um, these actually these questions actually are coming from uh, from James, who's actually a clinical research fellow. He reached out by email just looking for some more information about the, the some of this work. Um, he's a clinical research fellow at Imperial College in London, and he's doing a review of core outcome sets in neonatal care for pediatric research that he's doing. And he was he was first. Uh, I'll just ask. He's looking for uh, places that he can reference for this work, uh, publications, et cetera. Where would be the best place to find more information about this for someone like him or others who are looking to um, uh, to, to, to sort of reference this research? Um, we're finishing. Um, we're, we're getting all the data uh, finalized in June, July. So we'll have to start um, doing the paper output in the fall. So this is really preliminary data that, it's the first time we speak about it, um, <laughs> the data you, you've heard. Um, the um, first, the paper by Jaworski is already in Journal of Perinatology, uh, in Journal of Pediatrics, sorry. Um, so the one by Jaworski, uh, you can see it in the, the PowerPoint. Uh, you can reach out to us by email, but all the other parent important outcomes and core important family outcomes, and we want to develop to some respiratory important outcomes because parents really speak about feeding and eating and there are a lot of practical outcomes in there so we will develop these two all right he also goes on to ask uh, will you be collaborating with other groups looking at neonatal outcomes for example his group over in the uk uh, he says many researchers really want to know what parents want and would like to incorporate your work with uh, other outcome def definition initiatives so if you're looking for others uh, to collaborate with i think there's some interest uh, over across the atlantic there we're always open to new collaboration so uh, we'll be more than happy to uh, to talk with people in across the ocean and where would be yeah. the best, uh, you mentioned a contact by email. We've got your um, Twitter and Facebook up there. It, it, what would be the best email address to, for people to uh, to contact? You can um, certainly contact, um, this is Anne in Vancouver, um, mm -hmm. and my email is, uh, is asinus at cw.bc.ca. Yeah, if you could type that into the uh, little chat box um, in the bottom of your control panel, we can send that out yeah. to the uh, to the to the audience, and they would um, uh, with, <clears throat> then they'll they'll have that, so we don't make a spelling mistake in that when we uh, try to do it verbally. If you don't mind just typing it in there, um, yeah. the next question is asking uh, if the team feels that there is a difference between trial outcomes that inform future patient decisions regarding treatments and family focused outcomes that we should measure to plan for the future of an individual child. And maybe we can start, uh, well, while Anne's out uh, typing her email address into the box, but maybe we'll go to the start with the folks in uh, Montreal on that one. So it's individual decisions versus group decisions. So this is what I was, uh, when I said four reasons or reminding to measure outcomes, well, when we measure group outcomes, eventually there's some policy statements that are made looking at group outcomes. Um, and that's always a problem with mixing up policies and mixing up individual care. So it's it's very difficult. So yes, we can improve outcomes by looking at if we ventilate babies that way, it increases cerebral palsy. So let's ventilate them differently. So that's easy. Then taking life and death decisions is, um, uh, I'm a clinical ethicist, so we, we've written a lot about that. Um, what a parent will think is a profoundly unacceptable outcome um, is very different from what another parent will say. 
And I think this always needs to be individualized. So some families will terminate for Down syndrome, while other families will adopt kids with Down syndrome. Um, that's an easy example. Um, but then we, the shared decision making that is into this needs to require an open mind. And as neonatal researchers, we've been brainwashed into seeing everything very negative, glass half empty, and looking only at deficits. So I think that the research out there needs to show the positives, needs to show research in a way that what for what is important to parents, it's not the CP, the cerebral palsy, it's how the kid will function with cerebral palsy. What does that mean for the family? And this is what we've not done very well. All right. And the, uh, the, the, the next question uh, is asking regarding the research agenda uh, from, from the, he says, from the interesting results presented during the seminar, it's not yet apparent to him what parent valued outcomes should be improved and researched in trials. For example, how to pick the next trials research question. So maybe we'll go out west to, to Anne out west for that one. Okay. Uh, so as we've mentioned, this is research in progress, and when we have the results of the um, four different projects, then our plan is to develop a um, working group with representations that includes, you know, parents, researchers, clinicians, um, etc., and um, and then during that um, process. Um, I mean, the first th thought is, yes, we'll be asking the question of uh, what outcomes should be reported in the um, CN Fund, for example, annual report. What should we be reporting in our manuscripts? Um, and then when it um, we haven't specifically identified outcomes for clinical research trials. So I think those results uh, will help um, provide guidance on that. Um, and I'm, um, we also put on our slide that uh, we're looking at probably at the Pedi Pediatric Academic Society meeting in 2020, um, looking at having a workshop or session on outcomes. And part of that comes from conversations I've, um, I've had with Dr. Vore and Dr. Hintz from um, the United States, uh, their NICHD and Enail Research Network, um, about an interest in defining um, what outcomes should be reported, not just in Canada, but uh, internationally as, um, as well. Um, so it's still early enough that we are open to um, other suggestions of where we take the results um, when we have them. All right. And with that, I think we do. Uh, we are pretty much out of time. We're just a couple of minutes over our, uh, our typical end point. Uh, so I think we'll wrap it up there. That is actually the end of the uh, questions. We had a number of people asking if we can if they can get copies of the presentation, et cetera. We do record this session and make it available afterwards so we can get that to you. We do have uh, our three uh, three of our presenters uh, email addresses in the chat box that you can see there. Uh, and since this is part of the uh, child our, our series that we're doing with uh, Child Bright, a number of webinars, we just put a link in the chat box as well that takes you to a survey if you don't mind uh, filling that out and really helping uh, uh, our, our colleagues at Child Bright understand the impact of their research and of their uh, of these webinars etc there's a few questions questions in there it's not uh, it's not a super long uh, uh, survey so please uh, help them out uh, uh, and improve their work by clicking through to that survey um, so before we sign off, I'd just like to hand it back over to the team. As I said, we are out of time uh, and we did get through all the questions, but I'll just hand it back to, uh, to you each. We'll maybe go to, the, to Anne in Vancouver and then we'll go to the folks in Montreal. Just any closing key messages that you'd like to leave the audience, uh, uh, leave them uh, or send them off with as we, as we sign off. Just anything you'd like, any key messages, places they can go to find uh, sort of the next round of work that might be coming up or anything to expect coming up. Just anything you'd like to leave them with before we sign off. And we'll go to you, Anne in Vancouver. Well, I want to, to say that 
um, one of the most fun things when you're doing research is having um, great partners to work with and that uh, reaching out to my colleagues in in Montreal and the parents um, has been an enriching um, experience and uh, and I hope that Childbright, which is funded through the um, patient oriented research um, work arm of CIHR is such a wonderful opportunity to experience that and I'll um, encourage others to do so. This is Rebecca from Montreal. Um, just to sort of echo what Anne said, it's been really amazing as a parent to be have the opportunity to be involved in this research. Um, as Annie said, this is certainly not to you know denigrate the research that's been going on as far as outcomes for preterm children, but just again from a parental perspective to make sure that that out, those outcome the the outcome research is balanced. Um, you know, the vast majority, I would think, of preterm children, if you were to ask their parents, are just like any other child. And if you really take a look at the literature, it's really hard to see that um, in the literature that's out there on outcomes. And so I feel like it sort of does these children and their families a disservice to not have that information there. So we're really hoping that this project will be able to, um, again, present a more balanced look at outcomes, particularly those that are considered, you know, important and impactful by families. And again, it's been an amazing opportunity to work with um, all of the people in this group. Thank you. All right. And with that, we'll uh, we will wrap up. Uh, you know, thanks again for the great presentation. I mean, we, we can tell by the, the questions and comments that come in how, how valuable this is. And, and in particular, Rebecca, for sharing your story. We, it, we, we always appreciate it when we hear from parents and, and from patients as it really enriches the, the conversations that we have in our clinical world and really sort of grounds everything that we do. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for your participation, as well as, of course, the, uh, all of our panelists today for such a great job. Um, so we do our web webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, uh, and it's always great when you can watch live as your questions and comments really do enrich the discussion. But when you can't watch live, as I mentioned earlier, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network at ken uh, sorry ken .children's Healthcare Canada .ca. Uh, All of the recordings, this recording, and as I mentioned, all of the other recordings that, uh, of the webinars that we've done as part of uh, the Child Bright series uh, and our and our regular series are all uh, on that website. Uh, our next web uh, webinar will be next week on May 15th, and we'll be talking about past, present, and future, striving to continuously improve access to autism diagnostic assessment. And we're going to be hearing from a team at Alberta Children's Hospital how they address uh, their rapidly increasing uh, prevalence of autism in their catchment area and how they created a new diagnostic pathway for children between, uh, diagnostic pathway for autism uh, for children between 12 and 39 months. Uh, the outcome of this work saw the group achieve a target of reducing wait times uh, uh, for the first appointment from 18 months down to one to two months. And they've sustained that for three and a half years without any additional resources. So it's a great uh, sort of opportunity to talk about how they've really uh, changed the culture there to a culture of continuous quality improvement and, and seen sustainable uh, impact in that in their program there, at least with uh, respect to autism diagnosis in the, in the Calgary and Southern Alberta area. So a great presentation uh, coming up uh, next week from those folks. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks again to Rebecca, Dr. Uh, uh, Jean Vier, Dr. Mai Lu, and Dr. Sinis. Uh, great presentation today. And hopefully we'll see lots of uh, you back here next week. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.